I didn't understand the genuine significance of a family until I was seven years old. Everyone just calls me Becky, even though my name is Rebecca. As a child, I thought that all families, like mine, were unwelcoming, frigid, and devoid of affection. My dad was a successful dentist with his own practice, and my mom worked as his nurse, so they provided me with material support, but that was all. As far back as I can remember, hugs and kisses were unheard of in our household. My parents never showed me any affection, so I grew up thinking that was just the way things were supposed to be. Even though I always had nice clothes to wear, a beautiful house, and delectable food on the table, something was still missing. It was nowhere to be found. Our family didn't get together very often. We didn't have many guests, and I never went to other kids' houses. We were by ourselves in our little bubble. Though everything seemed normal at the time, looking back, I can see how alone we were. Everything changed when I got to know Sarah, a girl in my class. Once, after school, she asked me to remain at her house. I vividly remember walking into her house for the first time and feeling like I had entered another world. Sarah's mom welcomed us at the door with a kind smile. Hello, sweetie, she exclaimed, throwing her arms around Sarah. You also need to embody Becky. I'm glad to have met you. Before I knew what was happening, her arms were encircling me. Unsure of how to react, I froze. The hug was warm and comforting. I was overcome with all these odd feelings, and my eyes started to water. As we worked on our assignments in Sarah's living room, I noticed the variations in the mood. Occasionally, Sarah's mother would drop by to check on us and occasionally give Sarah a quick kiss on the cheek or twirl her hair. Every time, I felt an agony in my chest. When it came time for me to go, Sarah's mother offered to drive me home. As we approached my house, she turned to smile at me. Becca, having you over was a delight. You're always welcome. Then, to my utter amazement, she reached out and kissed me on the cheek. Good night, my love. Confused, I stumbled out of the car. When I got home, my parents were seated in the living room, engrossed in their own conversations and activities. My mom was reading a book, and my dad was sorting through some files. I hesitated before answering, I'm home. My mom barely gave it a glance. Did you complete your assignment at Sarah's? Yes, I replied, then summoned the courage. Why don't you ever give me a goodnight kiss, Mom and Dad? For a while, there was an intolerable silence. My mother finally looked up from her reading, her expression a mix of confusion and displeasure. What are you talking about, Rebecca? We provide you with a shelter over your head, food, and clothing. That should be more than plenty for you. My heart fell. But, that's enough, Rebecca, my father responded, not taking his eyes off his papers. Go to your room and prepare for sleeping. That night, as I lay in bed, it seemed to me that something was wrong in our home. The warmth I had felt in Sarah's home was almost entirely absent. As I dozed off, I wondered why my parents could never love me as much as Sarah's mother did. As I grew older, the glaring differences between my family and others became increasingly apparent to me. I became more aware of the issue by the time I reached adolescent. My mother was the root of the problem. Mom had always come across as a cold individual who was incapable of expressing any emotion, much less love. Not only did Mom mistreat me, but I noticed that she appeared to be less connected to Dad. She seemed unbreakable, uncompromising, like if she were made of ice. I noticed more and more how burdened they were with their parental obligations. Even though they would attend parent-teacher conferences, their faces usually conveyed a hint of irritation, as though they would much rather be somewhere else. 
I mistakenly believed that maybe things would improve when I turned 16. Maybe they would surprise me with a kind present or just a warm hug. Instead, I was given a sobering reality check. Over breakfast, Mom spoke to Rebecca in her dull, monotonous voice. Your father and I need to discuss something with you. Dad cleared his throat. We want everyone to know that you shouldn't rely on us to pay for your educational expenses. It's not essential that we do. The words hit me like a slap in the face. I just stared at them, dumbfounded. Mom continued, seemingly oblivious to my stunned expression. You're old enough now to start thinking about your future. You'll have to find a way to pay for college yourself if you want to attend. I pushed away from the table and nodded numbly. I managed to say, Thanks for letting me know. And then I went back to my room. For me, that day was a turning moment. I came to the realization that I had to pursue my own goals in life if I wanted anything. I couldn't expect my parents to support me. They had made that very evident. I realized I needed to start making more money after high school. Even though attending college looked like a far-off dream, I was committed to doing so eventually. That's how I ended up getting a job as a server at Joe's Diner, a little eatery a few blocks from our home. The proprietor, Joe, was a middle-aged man with a gut that suggested he had done too many taste tests in the kitchen and a permanent five o'clock shadow. He gave me the cold shoulder and a little uncomfortable smile when I applied for the job. All right, he remarked, gesturing to his chin. You'll draw clients with such appearances, my dear. You've got the job. After three months at my new employment, my life changed drastically once more. My parents summoned me down for breakfast on a Tuesday morning as I was getting ready for my afternoon work. This was odd, because we hardly ever ate together, much less talked over meals. My parents looked at each other as I sat down. My mum spoke first, her expression as neutral as ever. I have some news for you and your father, she remarked in an emotionless manner. It's determined that we will sell the house and relocate to Europe. The sale will be completed the following month. I waited for them to go on, to tell me what they had in store for me, but they remained silent. I finally reached my breaking point. So what? What about me? I asked, my voice small. Am I coming with you? My parents exchanged another look, this one tinged with what seemed like annoyance. My father cleared his throat. Rebecca, you're an adult, he said, his tone matter-of-fact. It's time for you to find your own place to live. We fulfilled our duty. You're of legal age now, which means you need to figure things out on your own. Anger and disbelief welled up inside me. This is my home, too. I shouted, standing up so quickly my chair toppled over. You can't just throw me out. My father actually laughed. A cold, humorless sound that sent chills down my spine. This house is my property, Becky. You have no claim to it. Tears stung my eyes as the full weight of their callousness hit me. Without another word, I ran upstairs and started throwing my belongings into a suitcase. As I was about to leave, my parents stopped me at the door. Show us what's in the suitcase, my mother demanded, her eyes narrowed with suspicion. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Are you serious? You think I'm stealing from you? We just want to make sure you're not taking anything valuable, my father said, as if it was the most reasonable request in the world. That was the last straw. Years of pent-up anger and hurt came pouring out of me in a torrent of curse words and accusations. I screamed at them, calling them every nasty name I could think of, telling them they were the worst parents in the world. They didn't even flinch. When I ran out of steam, my mother simply opened the door and gestured for me to leave. 
With nowhere else to go, I headed to Joe's diner for my shift, dragging my suitcase behind me. Joe looked up from behind the counter, his eyebrows shooting up when he saw my suitcase. Becky, what's going on? I tried to keep it together. I really did. But as soon as he asked, the dam broke. Tears started streaming down my face as I told him everything. How my parents were selling the house, moving to Europe, and had kicked me out without a care in the world. Joel listened, his face growing more concerned with each word. When I finished, he reached out and took my hand. Oh, sweetheart, that's terrible. Listen, I might be able to help you out. For a moment, hope fluttered in my chest, but then I saw the look in his eyes, and my stomach dropped. You could stay at my place, he continued, his thumb rubbing circles on the back of my hand, but you need to show me how grateful you are. I yanked my hand away, disgust replacing my sadness. Are you kidding me? Joe's face hardened. Fine, have it your way, but if you're not going to take my offer, you can consider yourself fired. I don't need your drama in my diner. I rented a room at a cheap hostel for the night. As I sat on the lumpy bed, I pulled out my phone and opened my parents' social media pages. I'd never paid much attention to them before, but now I scrolled through their friends list, desperately looking for any relatives who might be willing to help me. One by one, I reached out to them, explaining my situation, and one by one, they turned me down. Some were polite about it, others less so, but the result was the same. No one wanted to take me in. Just when I was about to give up hope, I got a message from someone I'd never met. My mother's aunt, Evelyn. She lived in another state but said she'd be willing to let me stay with her for a while. With no other options, I used the last of my money to buy a bus ticket to Aunt Evelyn's town. When I finally arrived, Aunt Evelyn was waiting for me at the bus station. She looked a lot like my mother, with the same sharp features and steely eyes. Rebecca, she said, nodding at me. Welcome. As we drove to her house, Aunt Evelyn laid out the ground rules. You can stay in the spare room. I expect you to keep it clean and help out around the house. And you'll need to find a job. I'm not running a charity here. The next few weeks fell into a routine. I found a job at a local cafe, worked long hours, and spent my free time cleaning Aunt Evelyn's house and cooking meals. She was always polite but distant watching me with a weariness I couldn't understand. One evening, as I was dusting the living room, my eyes fell on a framed photograph I hadn't noticed before. It showed a young man with a bright smile, his arm around a younger version of Aunt Evelyn. Aunt Evelyn, I called out. Who's this in the photo? I heard a sharp intake of breath behind me. When I turned around, I saw something I never expected. Tears in Aunt Evelyn's eyes. That's, that's my son, she said, her voice cracking. He died in a car accident ten years ago. I put down the duster and did something I'd never done before. I hugged her. To my surprise, she hugged me back, her body shaking with silent sobs. When we finally pulled apart, Aunt Evelyn looked at me with wonder. You know, I always thought you'd be just like your mother, cold and unfeeling. I shook my head, feeling my own tears welling up. I thought you were just like her too. I guess we were both wrong. As the days passed, Aunt Evelyn and I grew closer. The warmth I'd always craved from my parents, I found in her. We'd spend evenings talking, sharing stories, and slowly healing the wounds of our pasts. For the first time in my life, I felt truly loved and accepted. One evening, about two months after I'd arrived, Aunt Evelyn sat me down with a serious look on her face. 
My heart skipped a beat, fearing the worst. Was she going to ask me to leave? Rebecca, she began, her voice soft but firm. I want to talk to you about something important. When my son died, I set aside money for his college education. It's been sitting in an account for years now. And, well, I've been thinking. She reached out and took my hand, squeezing it gently. I want you to have it for your education. I stared at her, unable to comprehend what I was hearing. What? But that's your son's money. I can't. You can and you will, Aunt Evelyn said firmly. My boy would have wanted it to be used for something good. And you, Rebecca, you deserve a chance at a better life. Without hesitation, I threw my arms around her, sobbing into her shoulder. Thank you, I whispered. Thank you so much. Just like that, my life changed again. I enrolled in the local college as a business major, determined to make Aunt Evelyn proud. We settled into a new routine. I'd go to classes during the day, work part-time at the cafe in the evenings, and spend my nights studying at the kitchen table while Aunt Evelyn knitted in her favorite armchair. For two years, life was good, better than good. Actually, it was everything I'd ever dreamed of. I had a loving family. I was getting an education, and I felt like I was finally on the path to a bright future. But life has a way of throwing curveballs when you least expect them. It was a crisp autumn afternoon when there was a knock at the door. I was home alone, working on a paper for my marketing class. Assuming it was a package delivery, I opened the door without a second thought. The woman standing on the porch made my blood run cold. Her hair was grayer, her face more lined, but there was no mistaking those cold, hard eyes. Hello, Rebecca, my mother said, her voice as emotionless as ever. I gripped the doorframe, my knees suddenly weak. Mom? What? What are you doing here? She looked past me into the house, her lips pursed. I need to speak with Evelyn. Is she home? I shook my head, still in shock. She's out running errands. She should be back soon. My mother nodded curtly. I'll wait then. Before I could protest, she brushed past me into the house. I closed the door, my mind racing. What was she doing here after two years of silence? Why now? As we sat in uncomfortable silence in the living room, I took a good look at my mother. She wasn't the well-put-together woman I remembered. Her clothes were wrinkled, her hair unkempt. There was a desperation in her eyes that I'd never seen before. Finally, Unable to bear the tension any longer, I broke the silence. Why are you here, Mom? She met my gaze, and for a moment, I thought I saw a flicker of emotion. But it was gone so quickly, I might have imagined it. I need help, she said flatly. Your father and I are no longer together. We moved to Italy as planned. Your father. He met someone else, a younger woman. He left me for her. Before I could respond, we heard the front door open. Aunt Evelyn walked in, her arms full of grocery bags. When she saw my mother, she froze. Helen, Aunt Evelyn said, her voice clipped. What brings you here after all this time? My mother straightened her posture, trying to regain some of her old authority. Evelyn, I need your help. I've fallen on hard times. Aunt Evelyn's eyebrows shot up. Oh, and what about your comfortable life in Italy? Things didn't work out as planned, my mother replied, her voice tight. John left me for another woman. I have nowhere else to go. You're my only option. Aunt Evelyn let out a harsh laugh. Oh, that's rich coming from you, Helen. Do you remember when I needed your help when I lost my son and couldn't even afford a proper funeral? Where were you then? I saw my mother flinch, 
but she quickly regained her composure. That was different. Different? Aunt Evelyn interrupted, her voice rising. How was it different? Because it wasn't you who needed help? The tension in the room was unbearable. I felt like I should say something, do something, but I was frozen in place, watching this family drama unfold. My mother's eyes suddenly locked onto me. Rebecca, she said, her voice taking on an edge of desperation. You owe me. I'm your mother. I felt a surge of anger rise within me. I owe you. You kicked me out without a second thought. You told me I was on my own. And now you have the nerve to say I owe you. I raised you. My mother began. But I cut her off. You provided the bare minimum. I spat out. Food, clothes, a roof over my head. But you never gave me what I really needed. Love, support, affection. You were cold and distant my entire life. And when I needed you most, you threw me out like I was nothing. My mother's face paled, tears streaming down my face now. But I didn't care. And now you come here expecting help? Expecting me to forget everything you've done, or rather, everything you didn't do. Well, guess what, Mom? I'm doing just fine without you. I found someone who actually cares about me, who supports me, who loves me. I don't need you anymore. The room fell silent after my outburst. Aunt Evelyn stepped forward, placing a comforting hand on my shoulder. I think it's time for you to leave, Helen, she said firmly. My mother looked between us, realization dawning on her face. Without another word, she stood up and walked to the door. As the door closed behind her, I felt a weight lift off my shoulders. I turned to Aunt Evelyn, who pulled me into a tight hug. I'm so proud of you, sweetheart, she murmured, stroking my hair. You stood up for yourself. You're stronger than you know. As I cried into her shoulder, I felt a mix of emotions. Relief, sadness, anger, and strangely, a sense of freedom. For the first time in my life, I had confronted my mother and spoken my truth. It hurt, but it also felt like the beginning of healing. About a week after the incident, I was walking across campus when I overheard a group of my classmates whispering and glancing in my direction. As I got closer, I caught snippets of their conversation. That's her, the one whose mother. Can you believe she'd abandon her own mom? My stomach dropped. How did they know about what happened? I quickened my pace, my cheeks burning with embarrassment and anger. It didn't take long to figure out what was going on. My mother had taken up residence in a cheap motel on the outskirts of town and had started showing up at the college, telling anyone who would listen about how her ungrateful daughter had abandoned her in her time of need. For days, she sat on a bench near the main entrance, accosting students and staff alike with her tale of woe. My classmates began to whisper behind my back, some giving me looks of pity others of judgment. I tried to ignore it, to focus on my studies, but it was hard. One afternoon, after a particularly grueling class where I could feel everyone's eyes on me, I broke down and told Aunt Evelyn everything. The next day, with Aunt Evelyn by my side for moral support, I approached a group of my classmates who were huddled near the campus coffee shop. I took a deep breath and spoke up. Hey guys, I need to talk to you about something, about my mother. Their expressions, which mixed tiredness and interest, turned to face me. I then started talking. I told them everything about my upbringing in a frigid, unloving household, about being expelled as soon as I became 18, and about my struggle to make ends meet until Aunt Evelyn took me in. I watched as their expressions went from doubt to horror to understanding as I spoke. Many people's eyes were filled with tears by the time I was done. Sarah, 
one of my classmates, came forward and gave me a hug. Becky, I truly apologize. We were clueless. Your mother? She gave it such a unique sound. After that, word rapidly got around. Equipped with the truth, my students turned into my most ardent supporters. My mother's attempts to talk to them about her experiences of being abandoned were met with resistance. As soon as she appeared, college security, aware of the circumstances, started to escort her off campus. I learned through the grapevine a week later that my mother had given up and moved out of town. She had moved back to our hometown, renting a modest apartment and starting work as a nurse at the community clinic. I was calm and relieved. Life had become routine and pleasant. Following the upheaval I experienced with my mother, I regained my composure and recommitted myself to my studies. I was on track to graduate with honors as my grades improved. My phone buzzed one typical afternoon as I was going over my notes for an impending exam. It was a message from my father, who I hadn't anticipated to receive. I opened it with a skip in my heart, a mixture of interest and trepidation. I hope this finds you well, Rebecca, stated the note. I'm contacting you because I want to make you an offer. I recently got wedded in Italy, and my son is now young. We are in need of daycare assistance. Would you be interested in staying with us? You might look after your half-brother as a nanny. Since you most likely don't have many prospects there, this can be a fantastic chance for you. I was amused and in shock at the same time while I was staring at the computer. What he had to give, after all these years of silence, was an unpaid nanny position for a half-brother I had never met. The sheer arrogance was nearly absurd. I typed one word in answer without thinking, no. Soon after, my phone began to buzz once more. My father started to inquire after my abrupt response, obviously surprised. Where was my residence? How was I going to feed myself? How was I spending my life? I smiled mischievously as I browsed through my photo collection. I chose a photo of me grinning in front of the business school building on campus and a photo of me smiling in Aunt Evelyn's quaint kitchen. I emailed these pictures with no remarks. It was answered right away. One after the next, more desperate than the last, came in. How could I have attended college? Where was the money coming from? Whose dwelling do I occupy? I inhaled deeply, relishing the instant. That's none of your business. I typed as my closing message. I blocked his number, feeling a sense of closure. Graduation day came and went, and before I knew it, months had passed. I looked around the crowd as I waited in line to get my graduation. Aunt Evelyn sat there in the third row, her pride radiating from her face. When my name was announced, she clapped the loudest, and as I walked across the platform, I couldn't help but smile. I silently promised myself that I would create a life that would make Aunt Evelyn proud as I looked at her. I would return the kindness and encouragement she had shown me. I would demonstrate to her and the rest of the world that family is about choice, love, and devotion, rather than just blood.